to you to introduce yourself. It'll go super smooth from there. But basically, as soon as I start that quote, that's the point where the, uh, the podcast recording will start. So awesome. we'll jump into it from there. <clears throat> All right. We don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And with that, I would like to introduce our guest on today's episode of The Switch, Mike Glover. Mike, welcome. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much. So before we get into uh, fieldcraft survival and some of the you know principles around um, preparedness and some of the other things I want to talk to you about, I want to just get a, a brief overview of sort of where you're coming from, your story. I know there are a lot of other places that you can go to sort of get the the fuller picture, uh, but just you know give us the uh, as much as you'd like to explain about sort of who you are, where you come from, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm probably known as a military guy. I mean, I spent um, most of my life from 17 to recently in the military, um, did four years in the infantry and the rest of my time uh, in a myriad of positions in special operations, uh, you know, working my way from E1, which is essentially no rank in the enlisted ranks, um, all the way to Sergeant Major at the end of my career, uh, which is the highest enlisted rank, which is E9, um, and then got out of the military and started doing contracting uh, with the Central Intelligence Agency for about three years. And at some point decided I was tired of working um, overseas and wanted to, you know, settle down a little bit. So I started a business uh, called Fieldcraft Survival, which focuses on the survival genre, but we call it modern survival, meaning preparedness. Um, So everything from mindset, equipment, uh, training, the list goes on. And that's what I've been doing for about the last four years now, since 2016. So what's the, what's the ethos of Fieldcraft Survival? Like, what's the, the mission of your company? Yeah, our mission hasn't changed. You know, some missions for businesses change based on how they evolve or progress. Our mission has stayed the same, which is to pre- prepare the citizen or civilian with the worst case scenario. You know, and, and we figure, you know, we don't, meaning we don't align with any political affiliation, right or left. We think that uh, disasters, whether man-made or natural, are um, equal opportunists. They they affect us the same way. And so our mission has always been from the beginning to encourage and then provide solutions for civilians who are looking at preparedness. Yeah, uh, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, the name of the podcast is The Switch. Like we, we like to talk about things that change our minds, change our perspectives, change our points of view. Um, two questions on that from you. I'll, st- I'll start with the first one. Basically, what do you think is like the biggest thing that sort of changed your mind or mindset in terms of preparedness, whether it was why something like preparedness, as you talked about it, is important uh, or how you should go about, uh, you know, building a level of preparedness in your life? Like, what do you think was the biggest switch in your mind in terms of, of preparedness? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I actually uh, ha- came to a realization in special operations, but also working with the CIA, that there was a small group of men. Um, now it's open to women, of course, special operations is, but at the time it was a small group of men that could go out into the worst circumstance, meaning the worst case scenario, where we're targeting you know, a foreign fighter, terrorist who is like the stereotypical you know name any you know stereotype of a terrorist the bad guy and truly capable bad guys that were capable of doing harm not not the fake bad guys um these guys would go against us and we would often you know i'd say 99 percent of the time come out on top and be successful and it, and it occurred to me that being in an exclusive community in special operations, I was privy to a lot of processes, a lot of training, a lot of equipment that set us up for success. And all that was preparation. It, there was no accident that we were successful every time we did it. And so I analyzed those processes all the way from planning to rehearsals, to the equipment, to the attention to detail, and realized that a lot of those things aren't taught in civilian life. Um, in in any facet, you know, even, even at the true family core of people who think they're prepared, it's not often, um, uh, taught in the family unit. So 
I decided I wanted to do something about that. And so we rolled out different variations and different training blocks, but that's been really the origin story of the kind of the tipping point of where I realized there was something there. And in the course of running Fieldcraft and sort of your experience training uh, civilians and law enforcement and, and, you know, helping people to increase their level of, of preparedness. What do you think has changed your mind most uh, since you started that? Um, really good question. I, I think what I realized most is preparedness isn't really a technical thing. I think it's more of a lifestyle. And I've realized that the more people that we accumulate, you know, originally it was like a marketing plan, right? You, you have reach, you get engagement, you have a market, and then you target that market. Well, I've realized it's become more than that. It's become kind of a subculture of people who are interested in preparedness in every aspect and then are looking for something. I've realized a lot of people in life, you know, they grow up with an absence of a a parent or the absence of both parents, the absence of guidance or mentorship. Um, and so a lot, I think a lot of people are looking for something to gravitate towards a community, a tribe. Um, and that to me has been the most significant evolution of the company, which is, uh, you know, we're just not focused on the bottom line uh, monetarily. We're, we're literally focused on developing and building a culture of human beings who are prepared and who are good people. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like going from from technical to really holistic, like you're one of the we'll, we'll get into sort of pillars of preparedness. But like, as I've seen, um, one of the important factors of preparedness that a lot of people neglect is community. Like, you, you know, a lot of people have this idea of like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, be this, this prepped guy who, you know, like, whatever, has some, some guns and some food in the closet, and then they forget to make some community-oriented uh, plan or mindset or, or whatever it takes to actually thrive in, like you said, uh, man-made or natural disaster. Like, you, you're not going to be, you know, by yourself, best case scenario. Um, you, you'll find other people and help other people and, yeah. Um, Okay, so let's break down like preparedness. I know we, we hit it at like a, a broad level. What does it actually mean? Like, what are you talking about when you say man-made and natural disasters? And like, how does that apply to people? Why, why should somebody bother some everyday person, whether it's, you know, rural America, New York City, or globally? You know, I think it's important to understand um, in the context of survival, what we're really talking about is where you are right now, sitting in your seat, chair, car, whatever you, wherever you're at, the reason that you are in your skin, you know, a walking, you know, cellular being is because of all the things that have transpired before you, um, including survival. If the, if your ancestors, if your primitive ancestors didn't go through the hardship that they went through, you literally wouldn't exist. And so we often forget that because it feels, you know, normal being in the complacent state that we're at where we just, we're comfortable. But there has been stress and there has been hardship, there has been adversity throughout our entire ancestral life. So survival at the start point is about um, thriving in your environment. And, you know, it's very difficult to put that into perspective for many people because um, how can you articulate survival when we're so comfortable and so uh, free, you know, for lack of a better term? So, you know, to start in survival, you have to understand that there's statistical probabilities, which is there are probabilities that you are going to be confronted with accidents, with disasters, natural, man-made. Um, a pandemic, the list goes on. So the key component to all of this is understanding one, survival psychology, but also uh, survival adversity and the mechanisms 
um, and the characteristics that lend themselves to surviving a bad circumstance. When I, when I speak on survival, I always have to highlight the fact that the only thing it really is, is you responding appropriately to a stressful situation. And so we, we articulate that there's you know, low grade stress, there's high grade stress. And in both of those conditions, you could kind of determine what your fate's going to be based on uh, though the way you react um, in low grade. Um, if, for example, you're stressed by small things in life and you're not very resilient and you overreact, then the idea is if you correlate that to high grade stress where you're punched in the face, literally, maybe figuratively, um, under uh, uh, a high intense disaster, you're more likely not going to make the right cognitive decision. You're going to be, you know, uh, people forget that adaptability is the number one characteristic of survival. It's being able to adapt in an environment and adaptability requires that you are cognitive, meaning you are not in a primal, primitive fight or flight state because, you know, that, that neurological process, that physiological process is intended for you to survive a primal circumstance. You know, if you're fighting a, a bear in the woods, you know, your ability to move, your ability to physically displace or fight for your life is inherent to that. But what I'm talking about is the more technical aspects of being cognitive, like maintaining situational awareness, like breathing, like calling 911 and being cognitive, uh, cognitive enough to give the dispatcher your circumstance. Um, and people don't realize that there is ways to prepare for that in advance. So when you, you are confronted with that type of stress, you could respond and react accordingly. What is the mindset of somebody who is not prepared and finds themselves in one of those high stress survival situations? You mentioned the flight or fight response. What are some of the uh, characteristics of somebody in that situation? Yeah, that's a, a good question. St stress, um, stress emulates itself in various forms. Um, a lot of people look at people who are under stress and they tend to over react and analyze and, and, and somehow correlate incompetence with their reaction. And what I tell people is you can have the smartest person on the planet. You can even have the most well-trained special operations operator on the planet and they can react poorly to stress depending on what the stress is. Here's a good example. When I was in Afghanistan in 2005, I was prepared for war and I had been trained at the highest, most elite level. I was an 18 Bravo. I was a special forces weapons sergeant. But one thing I wasn't prepared for was to be on the receiving end of a 107 millimeter rocket that has a kill radius of about 200 meters that um, when you hear it whooshing through the air sounds literally like a rocket ship coming uh, into your location. And when that started to impact, I realized I had no control. So having no control, for example, when you're trained at the highest levels can set a whole bunch of variables and characteristics that are not conducive to uh, survival. Um, one of them is your lack or your suppression of your, your breath. A primal characteristic of survival is suppressing your breath to be able to maximize oxygen to flow to the primary muscles because the blood flows to that. That's why you have auditory exclusion. That's why you have visual impairment. That's, that's why different things do uh, different uh, uh, characteristics to different people. So I had auditory exclusion. Well, that's cool because I was on a 50 cal shooting back at the bad guys um, and I needed to retain my hearing at some point. But not cool when I hear, when people are trying to yell at me and then coordinate how we're going to respond to this attack. So people going into shock, people hyperventilating, people laying in the fetal, um, people crawling away, people screaming, the list goes on. Uh, one thing that I do in survival seminars is I take a, a screen capture of a photograph that was taken at the end of the Boston Marathon bombing um, where you know, two terrorists detonated a pressure cooking uh, bomb that destroyed a lot of lives, killed, maimed, injured. 
And you could see in different people's reactions, different characteristics of their preparation phase or their level of preparation. Um, you see first responders in military running to the smoke because they're trained to react and respond. You see people who have been severely injured screaming and holding their wounds. You see people holding their ears and screaming as loud as they can. Again, a lot of the things that happen in these kind of circumstances aren't necessarily advantageous in survival, primitive as they are in today's society and modern survival. Yeah, we, we actually talked about the Boston Marathon bombing on our last episode. We were talking with oh, wow. uh, Josh Nass, the uh, ham radio crash course guy. Yeah, I love him. I love Josh. Uh, he says hi, by the way. And oh. uh, we were talking about in the strategy of preparedness, just a, the comms situation. So Alex and I were a couple blocks away from that and we managed to get phone calls out, but pretty immediately thereafter, whether it was, I don't know if they turned cell towers off or if it was just jammed up with people calling, like you couldn't get calls out for a little while. Um, so we, we talked about sort of a comms plan in terms of preparedness. Um, but one of the, so one of the things that that made me think of, you're talking about sort of the primal response to stress. Uh, that makes me think that there's something inherent about it that is permanent. Like why, why, how would you actually transform someone's response to stress? Uh, like what of those primal response factors are permanent? You can't get rid of that. That's just going to happen to you. And how much can you, or do you want to train some of those things uh, out of you or retrain those responses? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting, and, and many people don't pay attention to these details, but they're important. But let me give you an example. If um, most people who don't understand my career field think that special operations guys, you know, that's inherent to every service, they think we're adrenaline junkies. And when I first heard that term, I, I knew what it meant, but I didn't know what it meant in the context of my job because I never – felt real adrenaline, meaning I never had moments um, that filled me with adrenaline and doing the dangerous things that I did. And, and the reason I didn't is because of training, because of conditioning. When you are conditioned, you, you basically replace the physiological response to stress with a level of confidence in training that allows you to navigate that world and stay, I like to say, stay cognitive, right? Stay aware, but stay conscious. Because typically, uh, one of the most dangerous things that happens when, you know, this is the hypothalamus that activates the sympathetic nervous system and actually overactivates and stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, dumping adrenaline and cortisol and these, these hormones that are designed, these chemicals that are designed to facilitate survival. But most of it has to do with physical survival, meaning physically displacing or physically fighting with a predator, with the enemy, with whatever it may, may be. And so that's not really advantageous when you have to use your brain to get out of technical danger, right? So uh, one of the, the, the a classic example is uh, self-defense with a firearm, right? We, we typically go through a fight or flight response because uh, that's inherent to the chemicals that are dumped in your body. Well, when you go through that process, primarily it's advantageous for you physically to survive, but it, but technically it's not, um, it's not advantageous, meaning you're going to want to displace your physical body. Well, that might be advantageous by moving yourself off the X, which is the bad, the bad place. Well, that might not be advantageous if I have to draw a pistol using my hands and then use my fingers to manipulate the trigger on that pistol and then stay aware of what my eyes are going to see. I mean, I have this argument, I'll call it a debate, with a lot of tacticians and firearms experts who, who talk about front sight focus, for example. You know, front sight focus, focus is a fundamental of marksmanship. The reason it's a fundamental of marksmanship because marksmanship is inherent to a lot of time. You have all the time in the world. Slow aim, fire, national match, pistol competition you have all the time. Well, when you're fighting for your life and a fight or flight response and, and you don't have the abilities to get cognitive, your body is not going to find, your eyes are not going to find that front sight. And so 
most tacticians who haven't been in gunfights in real life don't understand that. But I didn't even understand it. You know, I, I read On Combat and On Killing by Grossman, and those were the Bibles on the physiological responses, except for, unfortunately, uh, Grossman's never killed anybody in combat. So he's doing everything by secondhand information. And no offense to Grossman, but a, a lot of the things he quotes and a lot of things he cites are, aren't factual. They're not really what happens to people under stress. And he, he quotes a lot of case studies, and those case studies aren't scientific. Um, they're just questioning of people. But the, the bottom line is, when you are trying to stay technical, cognitive, conscious, uh, it's very difficult. And the way to train that is by conditioning people. Um, stress inoculation, for example, is a good way to, to train stress out of the, the reaction to stress out of people. There are downfalls to it. Um, I remember being in a gunfight in 2007 against foreign fighters. We winded up uh, killing uh, 13 bad guys that were the most highly trained bad guys I've ever met on the battlefield. And we all survived. We lost a dog. Uh, we almost got, we, a lot of us almost got killed. But I remember looking around at the guys around me and we're in the dark. We have night vision on and they were standing around laughing. Now, laughter is a, uh, a physiological response to stress. It's a way to cope with stress. But my guys were so conditioned to stress, to, to this kind of thing, that their reaction, instead of getting cover or laying prone or pulling security, was just standing in the open and laughing. If a bad guy with a machine gun came out and got a, a, a position of grazing fire across that open field, he would have gunned down everybody. So it took me to realize what, what was going on, to yell at my guys, to tell them to get behind cover and, and to keep it down. So um, there is a process. We train that process in our, in our pistol courses, our carbine courses, and the way we teach stress inoculation to police officers and military. Um, but it's a long process. It, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. What about longer term? Um, you know, you, you use the term technical danger. I think that's an awesome term for that. What about longer term technical danger? Like I'm thinking Hurricane Katrina, lost in the wilderness, things like that, where, you know, your immediate physical responses to realizing you're lost may not be so severe. Like you're not going to black out when you look at your map and don't know where you are. but that is a technical danger that could take three days to kill you. Like what are some of the responses that people have to that that are potentially negative? And then again, how do you train to have the proper mindset in that kind of situation? Yeah, so, so the way it works is, and, and this is it my own, this is me accumulating a lot of smarter people than me's information and make it make sense in the, in the uh, context of survival. But the way it works is the world around us is, is formulated by mental modeling. It's the way we navigate the world around us. The, the, reason, like if we, the reason we feel lost when we're lost in the woods is because we don't have a frame of reference for that model. So when we lose that model, we, we assume that we're lost. And that's, that's really a very primitive, ancestral, um, maybe even genetically ingrained thing where we don't recognize the model, it means something's wrong. Right? We recognize it as something that might be wrong, and then in this case, being lost in the woods. So one of the, one of the de detriments of, of that understanding is without training, we automatically assume that if we're lost, we need to find the mental model. Now, we might not even have an understanding what a mental model is, but we're just trying to get found by looking for things that are, that are familiar. So already, we start making bad decisions. People get lost. They get a high dose of stress that could come in the form of a lot of chemistry and fight or flight. And then they arbitrarily navigate the world around them looking for something that's familiar, getting more lost, right? So it, it, bad decisions start compounding themselves into worse decisions. So in long-term survival, the idea is we want to stop and vi get very aware of the circumstance we're in and make good decisions. You know, it, uh, pilots call these emergency procedures. Uh, after World War II, um, actually in the train-up for World War II in the 1930s, aviators didn't have emergency procedures that were broken down into acronyms. What they did was they did a cognitive process where they try to think through problems. The only problem is in technical survival, there's a solution. 
X goes wrong, we know that we have to use Y to get us to the proper uh, technical solution. Well, when, it, when somebody's under stress, we weren't realizing that they were navigating wrong ways or inefficient ways of trying to, trying to survive. So the solutions were taking too long, and by the time they sourced the solution, it was too late. So when we discovered that, we implemented in the U.S. Army Air Corps emergency procedures using acronyms. So X goes wrong, we use the acronym, and we go through a procedural process. So we're basically becoming more efficient. Remember, you know, you could be in a long-term survival circumstance, but you could be inundated with micro moments where you're trying to fight through high stress circumstances, the bear in the woods, being lost, trying to navigate, trying to fend, fend for your life, trying to source food and water. And so all those specific decisions need to be broken down. They need to be conscious and they need to be good decisions based on prior experience, prior training, and then make it in assessing what that best practice or decision is. Um, that's how we should analyze that world. And there's another caveat to that, which is the behavior within the model. The behavior within the model is called, called a behavioral script, meaning there are things that we should do within the model in order to facilitate survival. So uh, for example, if we look at the priorities of survival, well, the number one priority is exposure, because if we uh, are exposed to the elements and we get a temperature temperature swing of 30 degrees from day to night, then we're going to become hypothermic and we're going to go to sleep and we're never going to wake up. We'll just die. So if I look at that, if I have a behavioral script, meaning a way to source, make, and facilitate my survival, making a shelter, then I have the, not only the the understanding, but the mechanics in order to make sure that I'm going to survive that long-term circumstance. What about building? So I'm trying to formulate this question in my mind, because I, I think that there are pieces of this that you've already touched on, but can we talk about like technical versus mindset? Where do you see that border or how do those things intersect? Cause I, th I think a lot of people think, you know, I'm just going to get the gear. I'm just going to, you know, learn a couple of, of things from books, or maybe I'll read all the books, but like that's different than actually training your mindset. The only mindset thing, you know, we, we did talk about stress inoculation, but what other sort of mindset factors are there in terms of survival? Yeah, I, I look at mindset as the, as the, like the overarching umbrella that facilitates all of survival, right? It's, it shields and insulates all the technical skills because you could have the, the, the technical abilities to make a fire, but if you don't have the will, if you don't have the resilience, if you don't have the mindset, then when you're trying to make, let's say you're making a friction fire and which is the most, one of the most difficult things to do in primitive survival. Let's say uh, you're trying to make a, you're using a bow drill and, and you're failing at it. Well, if your mindset isn't aligned with your technical skill sets, and you're not resilient, then when you are getting defeated, when you are failing at making the fire and you quit, that could be a real easy way to lend yourself to dying or not surviving because you don't have the resiliency to continue on. Like I, I equate everything in survival and mindset to resiliency. Resilience, resilience is the most important element in mindset when trying to survive because it's not a matter of if, it's when you're going to be confronted with being defeated, right? You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days, short-term and long-term survival. So when you're behind the car hiding because you think you're going to die and you're so conscious that you're contemplating um, what's, what's, what's emotional stress versus being smart enough to realize that you need to fight through it, then you're not going to survive because you're contemplating right? You're not exercising this behavioral script that's technical. You're, you're thinking emotional. That's what separates, I think, us from other primates um, in, in, in survival and in the world, which is you have an immediate threat, right? You walk across a desert and you come across a, a snake. Well, it's an immediate threat. So there's a threat response. 
the immediate threat response is you primitively react to that. Might, maybe it's based off of experience, maybe it's genetic, but you respond, you jump back and you're like, oh no, there's a snake. Well, there's also called a fear response. The difference between a fear response and a threat response is a threat is very technical. It's the reaction, the immediate reaction to um, uh, something that's dangerous. The fear response is the contemplation. It's, it's, it's introducing the emotion, which is good for things like empathy, humility, and all the positive aspects of emotion, but detrimental uh, to in stre under stress in survival. Because now I see a snake and I go, oh no, and I jump back because that's my initial response. But now I contemplate fear. I say, well, I want to get home to my kids and I'm not going to make it out of this situation. And what if he bites me? And then when I could have been technically moving myself away from that danger, now I'm contemplating it with emotion. And that, that's where the, the two blend and become very dangerous. So what we want to do is we want to understand that being cognitive is not being emotional. It's being situationally aware. And it's having the mindset to be resilient enough to where when I'm getting defeated, I'm continuing to stay on the high plane of fighting back. And then I'm staying technical where I'm going through the technical motions to survive, but I'm not introducing the emotion in a fear response, only a threat response. Yeah, so let's, oh, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Uh, yeah, what are the most likely scenarios that the average civilian will find themselves, you know, that they should be prepared for? And are those situations ones kind of that you prepare for on a one-to-one -one basis based on likelihood? Yeah, you know what? I, I am big on statistical probabilities and survival. Like, I, I hate that. I hate the fear mongering. I hate, I hate the idea that we have to be prepared for the UFOs. We have to be prepared for Russia to invade. You know, what I tell people is in, in a spectrum of survival, you could prepare for the worst case. And when you do that, it kind of sets you up for everything in between. But I don't like the fringes of, of preparedness because there's so much energy that's required to focus on the, the statistical probability. Let me give you an example. Vehicle, motor vehicle accidents. There's about 9 million motor vehicle accidents a year. About 30,000 people perish in their vehicles in, in America. That is a lot of people. That's a lot of human beings dying unnecessarily, potentially. And I say unnecessarily because how many people were in those accidents who have, if they had the proper medical training and proper medical equipment, could either save their own lives or maybe save each other's lives? Um, it, you know, the prepared civilian, the prepared first responder. A first responder, depending on the location of where you live, uh, is a minimum of responding in about 12 minutes, right? And now with everything going on in the world, obviously the United States is going through some social, some social issues with policing. Uh, that's going to be longer. So the greatest example is a tourniquet. A tourniquet is a piece of equipment that I've used to save people's lives. I've, I've uh, seen save people's lives. I've used in combat. And a tourniquet is a $30 piece of equipment. I don't sell tourniquets um, to make money. I sell tourniquets really to give somebody the piece of equipment that's going to facilitate them. I pay $22 for a tourniquet that I sell for $30. If you're a business major, you know that's probably not a good economic or business decision. So when, when, I, when I put a tourniquet in somebody's hands, what I'm saying is this piece of equipment could save your life because the alternative is if you have a brachial bleed, um, if you have an arterial bleed, you're simply going to bleed out and you're simply going to die. So if you look at all the accidents, chainsaws, um, falling out of deer stands, uh, hunting accidents, shooting accidents, the list goes on. The highest statistical probability of anything happening outside of cardiovascular disease is an accident. So to be prepared with first aid and the way to use it, and then the way to use it under stress is imperative for, for every normal average person. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go into some of the fear aspect and bring up tourniquets because uh, the, well, the connection is when I started carrying a tourniquet every day, sorry, there are fireworks. Um, when I started carrying a tourniquet every day, the response I would always get is, what are you afraid of? Why are you afraid that something is happening? What's the you know, why are you having this fear response in your everyday life to the point where 
you feel the need to carry this thing. And I, you know, I don't feel a fear response, no, but I don't, don't, I don't yeah. have the, maybe I'm just not articulate enough. No, 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 to, no, no, no. You're, you're right. What, what you're, what you're, what you're truly identifying is what we call in survival psychology insecurity, right? It's not your insecurity. It's their insecurity because, mm. because the idea is, let's say you have a ham radio and I don't understand ham radios, but, but you understand because you're educated on ham radios. You know, you could listen to emergency management. You can listen to Homeland security and it's, it's a true, I mean, it's a $25. You can get a, a bowfang for 25 bucks on Amazon. So it's not like it's a overarching, you know, crazy idea. It's, it's a ham radio. You get your ham radio license. You get your technical license. You, you have the ham radio. It's in your bag. It's in your truck. So it's not inconvenient for you. So when somebody sees something that you have that they don't understand, and it has to do with something where you say, hey, well, the idea here is if you cut your arm when you're jumping over a fence and you start bleeding out of your brachial artery that feeds the highway of blood to your heart and you have three minutes to live, the difference between me and you is you die and I live. And the difference between me living and you dying is $30 and about 15 minutes of instruction. And right. so when somebody doesn't understand the literal translation of that, they're already a victim waiting to happen. And I, we see this, we, we truly see this um, in, in, our, in our genre where we've convinced people like that person that said that to you and they don't understand it, but then we articulate it. Maybe, maybe we message it just perfectly enough where they go, you know what, it doesn't hurt. And then they have it in their car and then they have an accident and then they save someone's life. They save their own. And we get emails, we get DMS, we get phone calls, we get letters of all these people who go, I never would have thought. And if I didn't pay attention and replace that paranoia or that insecurity with training, with equipment, with preparation, then I would have been a victim. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's so common in this industry and it's so common in this genre. Yeah. Oh, crying. <laughs> he's dreaming he's dreaming yeah and beyond that i mean not maybe not everybody will feel this way but when i first like started to sort of get into this however many years ago and bought my first tourniquet and went to a class i was like it was fun you know it, it was fun to learn some of those things and like uh you know they made it fun. it was a it was a Go Ruck Constellation event. That was my very first like sort of preparedness training anything. And they make it fun. Like you're happy that you're there, but at the same time, you're learning some things that that translate. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not a fear response in any way. Um, yeah. So if somebody is listening to this and they're still not uh they're still not on board there. You know, they, they might have that mindset of like, this happens to other people. It's like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that Calvin and Hobbes comic where the, the family, the family house gets broken into. And I forget one of his parents says, wow, like you always think it's going to be somebody else until you are somebody else. But like, what if somebody is still in that mindset of it's going to happen to somebody else? Like, how do you get that message across to people uh, for, maybe some of the bigger picture stuff like tourniquets you you made the you made the case for that really well but for some of the other aspects how do you make the case that this is something people should be paying attention to you know man our world is changing and you know if anybody look i did a post prepar preparation and, and uh, paying attention to this kind of stuff is my job but in November, I did a post on pandemics and I asked the question, are we prepared? You know, I, I did a mini blog series on pandemics and what it would do to our nation, um, the detriment and the and the the issues that would compound themselves if if we didn't if we weren't prepared and we weren't. And so nobody five, six months ago would have thought that our country could ever be on lockdown, that we'd be shutting down businesses, that we would be confining ourselves to our homes that we would be wearing masks on airplanes and in and, and stores, that we'd have to maintain a six foot social separation from other human beings, even our own family members, that over a hundred thousand human beings would die by themselves with no loved ones because we didn't want the loved ones to get infected. So 
you know, when we when we just look at that circumstance alone, right, right, which is happens to be one of the worst case scenarios in modern history, then we could see how all the things that happen around us shape our ability to live and shape our ability to thrive. Um, most people don't know a lot of things. They don't know how to change tires. They don't know how to make fires. They don't have to procure water. The list goes on. It's because we're very complacent. And that's a very, very normal benefit to living in a democratic free society. Well, what is your level of preparation or what is your value on your life? You know, I would say to most people, if, if you don't care because it just doesn't fit your lifestyle, then at least do it for your family. At least do it for your friends. Because in survival psychology, John Leach, who's a survival psychologist, measured, he did a, a really infamous uh, case study of natural and man-made disasters. And what he determined is the 20-80-10 rule, at the very bottom 20% of all people who die in natural and man-made disasters, they happen to be children. The reason they happen to be children is because children don't have the condition responses that are appropriate to survive. They don't have the cognitive ability to make good decisions because they don't have the experience. And so um, when I look at, uh, when I further break that down, one to six year olds actually have the highest survival rate in austere environments or outdoor survival. Seven to 14 have one of the highest rates because a one to six year old is very primal. They're not using cognition or decision making to advance their circumstance. What they're doing is they're cold, they get warm. They're hungry, they eat. They're tired, they go to sleep. They're, they're literal vessels of survival, primitive survival. You take that same thing for a seven to 14 year old who doesn't have a lot of experience, might have cognitive abilities to make a decision, but they, they, they make the wrong decision. Now, if you understand that and looking at your family, well, your family, your seven to 14 year old, your one to six year old, um, you, you are responsible for their survival. You are the, the catalyst, the conduit to them surviving. Without you, they would not survive. I mean, we're a very fragile species. So if you don't do it for yourself, do it for those around you that you love who happen to ha not have that potential capability. I'm a big proponent of self-preservation because I've seen, you know, nine times at war what war does to human beings, what evil human beings and evil circumstances can do to everybody. But the natural disaster that's waiting to wipe you off this planet doesn't care. And it, and it has no agenda other to, than to destroy you. And, and that happens all over the world. So at a minimum, be prepared for that. So I wanna, I wanna make sure we're uh, respecting your, your time here. I do wanna make sure that at the end, a couple of people get a chance to ask questions. Uh, but I have a, a couple more that, like I said at the beginning, I want to focus on a couple of questions that I don't think you get asked very often. And I want to uh, hear sort of your, your thoughts about these things. So first to the audience, if you have questions, go ahead and start putting them in the chat. We'll try to get to uh, as many as we can for Mike has to go. Um, but we'll sort of take the order of the chat. So my questions. First, on your Instagram, you more than occasionally post like books and things that suggest that despite the fact that you are, you know, what many would consider highly trained and experienced and, you know, all these things, you are still a learner and a student. What are the kinds of things that you are reading and what, what role does sort of learning and, and incorporating new information play in your life? Every training course that I start with, I always highlight that my instructors for my company uh, include myself, are the most highly trained people in the world uh, when it comes to disaster and catastrophe. Uh, we're, we're prepared for the worst case scenario. But what I also caveat that with is, despite our experiences, the reason we are very good um, at what we do is because of our open-mindedness and ability to learn. Uh, I don't think I would, number one, hire anybody who didn't have an open mind and wasn't willing to change. One of the biggest 
constraints and uh, var variables that stagnate growth, but also stagnate survival are your inability to open your mind to new ideas and new thought processes and, and, and be willing to change. I learned this the hard way in special operations where I operated with men who were like, this is the way we've always done it. You know, that's inherent to most institutions, but that's a, that's a very normal behavior for people. They fall into old routines and old habits and aren't willing to adapt, innovate and open their mind. So, I always have been a steward of um, academics, of experiences, of learning, and never saying that I am the end-all, be-all solution to anything, because I'm not. There's a thousand ways to clear a room, and I want to know the, the, the 2,000 ways to clear a room. So I go to my training courses with my instructors, and we learn more from our students than we can in any other facet because you have 24 experiences, uh, life experiences in a, in, a, in a classic course where you could take away even a small snippet from the most unexperienced person that might benefit you. I read survival, I read history, I read um, everything I can get my hands on. And I have, I'm staring at my library and I have thousands of books because I will, I refuse to stagnate my own personal and professional development. Um, and I, I think that's important. I think that's important in survival, but I also think it's important as people that we never stop learning and we never stop growing. You're muted, Chase. I'm muted. Just out of personal curiosity, can we see your library? Or if you don't want to show it now, can you, you like post a picture of it? I'm just, I'm yeah. super yeah, curious. Okay. But cool. I have about uh, 300 books in front of me, and then I have probably about 500 books below me, and then I have at my work at my office, I probably have another 500 on survival. I collect. Here's one thing too to caveat this with. I I also collect everything I can get my hands on when it comes to survival. That includes um, homesteading, growing uh, food, hunting, hunting guides, survival manuals, because. In the worst case scenario, which doesn't even have to be worst case. I mean, we've been affected by it here where I live in Prescott, Arizona, where the electricity has gone out for three days. Well, I have chickens. I have a vegetable garden. Well, now I don't have to reference Google because I have the reference material sitting on my bookshelf. So I think that's important. Have the library grow. I'm going to do a post on it because you said it. I'll do a post on it tomorrow awesome. uh, on, on developing as a person, but growing your own library to facilitate your survival, but be a part of your identity and persona because the books that you read are the person that you are. It's, it's right. pretty interesting. That's, that's exactly why I love seeing people's libraries. Okay. Uh, next question again, in the interest of time, Josh's off topic, which we may, we may skip that segment for this just again, because of the time thing was emergency fatigue. He was talking about sort of the response people have had to COVID and he used this term emergency fatigue where, you know, technically COVID as a, as a crisis is an emergency, but it is a very prolonged emergency with ups and downs. And especially considering the, the confusion as a result of the various channels of information and whether they're accurate or not, like people have some emergency fatigue. And because of that, at least what I've seen being in New York City and in the area that I'm in in New York City, the result of that has been complacency. People are not interested in following any guidelines, whether they're, they're reasonable or not. They're interested in being done. And like, what is it that leads people to that emergency fatigue? Like, do you see that? And do you see any way of um, sort of getting people through that if that's what they're feeling? Yeah, that's a great point, which is, um, you know, this, this is a long-term survival thing. The, the difference in this circumstance, I think that we often forget is if you look at all the things that happen uh, and statistically to human beings, we, we forget that we are living in a world of dodging probabilities with preparation, maybe just luck, 
and how we navigate the world around us. We get in our cars, we put our seatbelt on. We don't pay attention because we're conditioned conditioned in that response. And then we hit a head a car head on and hit an airbag with our face instead of hitting the the dashboard, uh, and we survive. So we have we have created mechanisms and conditioned responses to facilitate our survival in life. I mean, man, if you've never driven in Libya in Africa, it it's the most dangerous thing you could do on the planet because cars are coming head on towards you at a hundred miles an hour. Nobody wears their seatbelt. Uh, everybody's cutting each other off. There's no traffic laws. It's like an autobahn everywhere. Um, I've seen cars get hit head on. I've seen people thrown out of their cars and roll over accidents. Uh, I myself was T-boned in a state department vehicle where we destroyed a suburban on the side of the road. So a super dangerous environment. Well, those people have just accepted the risk. And so what's happening is you have a lot of people accepting risk. And when they, when they look at probabilities, they go, you know what, I'm just going to make the deliberate decision, maybe in complacency, to do what I do, to not affect how I live. And, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. I think a lot of people are, because at some point you just have to realize that we're dodging all kinds of probabilities. I mean, I love people who maybe criticize this and they're overweight, which is the number one factor of, of potentially being a victim of compromised immunity and dying from uh, uh, COVID. Um, or being overweight and realizing, not realizing that you're in the highest bracket of people dying where millions of people between uh, cardiorespiratory issues, cancer, which is, which is associated with uh, cardio disease um, or cardiovascular disease, that these people are in the highest risk bracket and probably won't make it past their 50th birthday. So I do see that. And uh, what I realize is in my own behavior, there are ways to accept the risk and, and, and to mitigate risk. So what I like about kind of the generalities in, in I, I don't like generalities at all, but generalities in this form is when you get guidance and generalities that allows you to get enough information to make your own decision as an individual. I think that's important because my idea in, as a libertarian is if you don't want to go about your life living in a bubble, and you want to risk your life not living in that bubble, then so be it. Versus if you want to live in your bubble off grid, you could do that too. So uh, one, of the, one of the inherent problems in everything that we're talking about is often being misguided by disinformation. So we need to accumulate that information. We need to make the right decisions based off probabilities. And we need to assume the risk that's natural for us. I mean, I jumped out of helicopters and airplanes for a living for 20 years. It's the most dangerous thing I've ever done. I've lost many friends doing it and I didn't want to do it because, you know, I did it because I wanted to be effective and efficient when I did it in real life in combat, but in training, I didn't want to do it, but it was just an inherent risk that I accepted in order to live my life in my specific career field. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. All right. Before I switch to audience questions, Alex, you got anything else? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, kind of following up on that question, how would you recommend somebody assess what level of risk they want to take on? Because kind of like what Chase alluded to, people's um, assessment of that might change over time if they get more and more tired of, you know, for example, staying inside, their level of risk they're willing to take on might increase. Is there a, a method you would use, even just something like writing down your thoughts or kind of where you stand with what level of risk you're willing to take in certain scenarios? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question because it has to do with kind of staying in the fight. You know, this, we, 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 as a, a broad term, a, a generalization, um, we, we say you got to stay in the fight and that's in mindset, but that's also in your everyday discipline. You know, I've, I've been a victim of complacency and paid the price for it. You know, I've lived overseas for a large portion of my military career in different countries, Yemen, Pakistan, Libya, Niger, Africa, Iraq, the list goes on. And these dangerous environments will kill you if you aren't conscious, um, if you aren't deliberately uh, observant and, and, and basically making the right decisions, not being 
uh, complacent. So one of the best tactics that I've seen is base it off the circumstances that you find yourself in. People with compromised immunity, if you're in a bracket of, of potential compromised immunity, you're obese, you have underlying health conditions, the list goes on, then you're at a higher risk, right? Uh, I'm, you know, you know, me being healthy and middle-aged, I'm in a lower risk bracket, but I could still be grossly affected. It's affecting different people based on blood, based on ethnicity. So I would find the data that correlates to my specific situation and then base my behavior based off of that. Like I, I would think it's really, one, I live austere. I don't like people per se. I, I just don't like social gatherings. I've never been a club guy, never been a bar guy, never been a really a restaurant guy. I don't like gathering in large gatherings normally. But I can imagine that if you're one of those people, it's very hard for you to disassociate from that life because that's maybe your persona, maybe your identity. So you have to think outside the box. You guys are doing a podcast on Zoom. Super smart. I've had to do that as well. You, you, could, you, you literally could use social distance to your advantage, whether that's work or your personal situation. You can get outdoors. Maybe you're somebody who works in a cubicle. Get outside because working outside, getting outside um, is going to allow you to be safer than, in, than contained in a small area. And also, like you said, I think that's a good idea. Making a deliberate plan to keep you present and in the now is important. We often check out because we think we're falling back or we think it's routine, but we're, not, we're very far from routine. Arizona just spiked right here where I'm at and we're the 49th in testing so we're we're like the highest bracket right now of of cases and we're also the lowest at the the overall that have been tested so what does that mean well it means I'm not going to Phoenix uh anybody who wants me to go to Phoenix they could come up here uh an hour and a half north uh they can meet me in my office um but uh, but I'm going to make the decisions that are best for me my family my friends and my and my employees Awesome. Um, Mike, do you have time for a couple of questions from people here? Sweet. Um, worst case, give me like the two minute warning when you need to leave and uh, we'll give you a chance to plug any of uh, the field craft stuff and all that. So let's go to Ed first because I heard from Joseph and Stacy. All right, Ed, you are up. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Michael, I appreciate it very much what you have to say, and uh, it was terrific. And uh, most of us haven't had the experiences or have probably the capabilities to do uh, the things that you've uh, been doing. Um, my question is that living in a place like New York City, uh, people are very much in a bubble. You have many different apartment buildings in a very... Uh, very dense situation. Uh, people are, are in a bubble and they're very limited in so many cases and what they can do. It would seem to me that any kind of uh, uh, good program in dealing with the disaster has to have some level of coordination with the police and uh, civic authorities because it really can't be, uh, you know, every man for himself. It has to have some kind of a program living in a very large city is a unique situation. People will not have access to their own uh, transportation easily. And uh, there are so many factors involved. It seems that coordination would have to be an essential uh, part of the program. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, one of the, you know, I have a degree, I have a bachelor's degree in emergency management and crisis response. And and the only thing that's done for me is show me the back end of the complexities of government responses to disasters. And Corona and COVID-19 is so very different than anything that anybody has ever responded to governmental or as a society. And, you know, that's why at the beginning of this podcast, what we talked about is social network. Social network is the foundation of your survival. And, you know, to me, it's a responsibility for me to take care of the, the people in my family that are older than me that might be potentially affected or uh, affected by uh, COVID-19. But the reason social networks are so important is because 
if I don't depend on the government because I'm self-reliant, because I understand that I am my own first response, I am looking at everybody in my network as a liability or an asset. And I hate to frame it that way because it sounds ugly when I say, hey, friend, you bring nothing to the table, you're a liability. But what that does is it lines out people's capability, but also their strengths and their weaknesses so that we can all facilitate each other. Because if I have a friend down the hall that is a partner of mine that happens to be, I don't know, a preacher or a religious leader, then they could provide religious guidance in keeping people together, keeping that community stitched together. If I have a neighbor that's down the road that's a doctor, well, I don't have to now depend on the doctor in the office, in the hospital, which exposes myself to more danger because I have that friend that's now part of my network. Networks are so important because, like you said, I think every government, local, state, um, and even federal, are having major deficiencies in their inability. And that, that happens to be the institutions that I worked for for 20 years. Like people think the CIA is a deep state. Well, man, if you work with the CIA like I did, you realize that they're, they're very a shallow state. They, they don't even have the ability to be very deep because there's not a lot going on there. Um, there is not a deep state. There, there's a bunch of people making mistakes and not very, being very efficient. So try to see if you could source your social network first, leverage them, and then advocate, like you said, for governments and, and people uh, in higher institutions to get their stuff together. All right, next is uh, DeAndrea. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Otherwise, I can ask your question for you. If you'd like. You could go ahead and ask it. All right. Uh, can you recommend one survival book everyone should have? Yes, I can. Um, actually, let me go grab it real quick, and I'll, I'll show go you. Go for it. Yes. Okay. So I grabbed two of them. That's why it took me so long. So the, the, the number one book I would recommend everybody get is what we use in the U S military. And this is FM three dash zero five dot seven zero or otherwise known as FM 21 dash 76. And, and the reason it's, it could be 2176 or FM three dash zero five point seven zero is because it changed to the Ranger Handbook um, uh, as 2176, but the old survivor manual is known as 3-005.70. Now, this book is like the Bible for survival. What it's intended to do is assist uh, special operations guys and aviators survive behind enemy lines. It's based off of the uh, academic, uh, really, schoolhouse that, that uh, Colonel Nick Rowe started um, in, in the 1970s. Colonel Nick Rowe was a Green Beret. Um, he started Seer, Seer High Risk C, which is Survival Escape Resistant Evade. Um, that has to do with his experiences spending five years as a prisoner of war um, behind enemy lines. Now, Colonel Nick Rowe wrote, wrote a book called Five Years to Freedom. I recommend everybody read books that have to do with people's resiliency, um, including Five Years to Freedom, because those type of books give you ideas on how they, in their own way, got through difficult circumstances. So that book's a very good book. The second book I would recommend is this book called The Complete Walker, and this one's the third edition. There are uh, various editions of this because it's been updated, uh, but The Complete Walker is written by Colin Fletcher. Now, you would probably ask, like, why would you recommend a hiking book? Well, a large part of survival has to do with your abilities to bug in, which means sustain survival in your house, 
and bug out, which means displacing yourself from a bad circumstance into a better one. This book, based on this guy's experiences hiking the Appalachian Trail, one is a great read, um, but two, breaks down individually all the specific pieces of equipment, including the weight, including the reason and specifications of why uh, he chose to use this um, uh, particular equipment in his packing list for his rucksack for surviving in austere environments. So this is truly like the Bible that we use for setting out uh, an understanding of why you would pack what you would pack for bugging out uh, and super important in, in all kinds of survival. Awesome. Thank you. Next is Chris. Hi, Michael. Um, thanks. I've enjoyed this talk a lot. I'm just wondering, um, uh, why do you think that some people tend to shut down in stressful situations, be tend to become overwhelmed, have difficulty making decisions, go into fetal positions? And is that something that could be like trained out of people? Is it more like a, an emotional thing, a psychological thing, or just a lack of training? Yeah, good, good question. And, and, you know, in my survival seminars, we talk about this in detail, but I'll give you the, 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 uh, the, the points. The way that survival is broken down, uh, that I break it down, is based off of John Leach's survival psychology, which is, you know, John took a, a case study of a whole bunch of different disasters and analyzed why people lived and why people died. The reason people die most often reflects their inability to manage and cope with stressful circumstance. So that neurological, that physiological process in fight, flight, or freeze is based off of their um, misunderstandings physiologically or out of their control of how their body is going to respond to it. So meaning the person who's laying in the fetal crying, sucking on their thumb, begging for their life, doesn't realize what's happening to them because they've never been conditioned for those type of circumstances, those type of scenarios. So the, the question is, how do you get better at it? One, it's developing a more resilient mindset. The best thing that you could do to develop a more resilient mindset is by testing yourself physically. Workouts of the day, long hikes, uh, camping, any kind of exposure to stress or trauma facilitates this callus that develops resiliency that allows you to get through difficult circumstance. And, and this doesn't have to be like, you know, MRF, the, you know, a high intensity workout of the day. Um, it doesn't have to be a 20 mile hike. This could be simply you going camping, you go camping and people go, man, I've never been camping before, but there was something about it that I was attracted to. What that often is, is besides the natural, a primitive state of where you used to belong in the environment um, and you would displace yourself from that. So there's familiarity there. Most often it's because you are stressed mildly. You can't bathe. Uh, you don't, you don't sleep your best. You're packing out a shelter. You're making a fire. You're doing these things that lend themselves to trauma and stress that when you come out of that and then you take that hot shower, you get that good night's rest, you go, man, well, that was really beneficial because you, you became more resilient and then you become addicted to it. That's why people uh, all over the world do things where they put themselves in dangerous circumstance because they want that exposure. Something else you could do is you could train. Technically, training allows you to script out the behavior that you could map while you're under stress, right? It, it, we talk about it in capacity. And, and, and I'm sorry, this is the long form version of it, but it's important to state. Um, neurologically, we process information in what we call tidbits. These tidbits of information are processed in our capacity, but we are not created equal in that capacity. Meaning you could be, you could have a, a big brain, you could be super intelligent, but your capacity to technically do something and then to operate technically under stress aren't the same. So here's an example. If me and you are conversing in a conversation, you're using about 60% of your capacity to process that information. That leaves you about 40% to, you know, see the attractive woman walking through the door, hear your buddy say something behind your back at the bar, right? You you're basically multitasking with that 40% of capacity. Well, you take yourself in a stressful situation and then you max out your tidbits 
or the processing of that information and you start hitting the red line. Well, that red line isn't uh, equal across the board. It's that aptitude in that way isn't equal across the board. But one way you could increase your aptitude to cope with stress is to train. That opens up your abilities. So now let's say you're fighting for your life with a handgun. Well, if you train, then you're just going into a behavioral script. You're drawing the pistol, you're aligning the sights, you're after you assess the threat, and then you're breaking the shots. Well, that process doesn't require a lot of cognition because you've trained it. So now you're using 50% of your tidbits, allowing you for 50% to be able to analyze, maintain situational awareness, make good decision, decisions instead of bad. I always caveat this with, um, you always wanna train technically and become efficient, but you always want to validate that technical training under stress. So if I'm learning how to technically put on a tourniquet to my arm, I wanna do it in the dark. I wanna do it after physically exerting myself. I wanna do it upside down. I wanna do it with one hand. Um, and then when I've maximized uh, my potential, then I wanna push myself to different limits. That's how you're gonna get better at this. Uh, I'll leave you with one last thing, which is an acronym. I use an acronym called Isolate, Rehearse, Repeat, I-R-R. Isolate means isolate the task, the technical task that you're going to do. Let's say it's a tourniquet. I'm gonna isolate the tourniquet on my right arm. I'm gonna rehearse how to put that on the most efficient way possible. If it's inefficient, I'm gonna to talk to my friends and figure out the most efficient way to do that. And now I'm gonna repeat what that looks like again and again and again. And some people don't like this, but I like it because it's an easy coin phrase. It becomes muscle memory. And then when things are muscle memory, it allows you to operate under stress and get through something. Why people go in the fetal, why they suck on their thumbs, why they act crazy, it's because they have no exposure. The more, the more ex export, exposure you can get to stress, the more technical proficient you could be, and the validation of that under stress is going to set you up for uh, being more prepared. Awesome. Uh, we have three more questions in the chat. I've stopped the stream of questions. Uh, next up is Joseph. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate the idea that you're continually to practice for muscle memory. How do you remove bias, like your own personal biases from that equation? And you kind of alluded with it with the idea of checking with your friends and, you know, having another opinion, but where you don't, you don't uh, get too much into a routine and you still maintain uh, your objectiveness when you're in a new situation. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. It's it's a constant check and balance on yourself. Uh, uh, look, the, the most often the we navigate the world around us based off of our experiences, which lead to personal bias, uh, biases, and and these bias can can literally transform our lives in negative and positive ways. Uh, what I tell people is a lot of, a lot of survival has to do with facts and science. And so when I, when I start skewing perspectives because of my own bias, I have to stop and really look at, at the fabric of what the context is. A good example is, you know, a good example is mindset. Mindset is a vague and indefinite term, which means a lot of different things to different people. But in the context of survival, it's very tangible to be looked at as resiliency, meaning uh, when you're defeated, you have to stand up, you have to continue to fight because the will to survive is what is gonna allow you to, to, to thrive. So what I would say to people is um, every single time you see yourself strain, whether that's a check and balance because of the friends and family around you or even your own self-observation and introspect, I would stop and analyze and, and relook the science and the facts behind what you're trying to accomplish. Look, that's, that's a constant struggle for me. I mean, I'm a Green Beret. I'm a former CIA security specialist. Uh, I, I have a lot of experiences that aren't even, you know, a, a lot of people think Green Berets are the subject matter experts at survival. We're not, we're not at all. I mean, I, I can tell you 
75% of the guys I work with have no idea how to survive primitively in the woods besides the two weeks of instruction they got. So we're already conditioned to bias in, in, that, in that form. Uh, and we get a false sense of security by instilling more confidence in our own abilities because we're afraid to confront ourselves with our insecurities, with our deficiencies more, um, more likely. So I'm constantly evaluating myself. I'm constantly evaluating those around me. And sometimes it can be ugly. You know, I, I work around a lot of guys who are like, you know, man, you just tell, tell it how it is. Well, most often I do because I want people to succeed. And I know beating around the bush in this kind of PC culture that we live in now is not conducive to thriving or even survival. Thanks for that question there. All right, David, and then the last will be William. David, you're up, you're already unmuted. All right, let me see if I can find David's question. I'll just ask it. Um, If not, okay, then we'll go to William and then wrap up. William Thomas, you are up. Hi, my great presentation. My question is, have you changed any of your recommendations since the COVID-19 crisis, or has it confirmed your preparations and uh, the courses you teach? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I have changed some of my recommendations. Um, a lot of the things that we said, or I said personally in the very beginning of all the things that were happening uh, had to do with uh, the forecasting of the potential worst case scenario. What, what I think, you know, one, I think we're making a very big error in how we're addressing this because we're not looking at, looking at it as individuals. A lot of people in the United States are basing what their behavior is based on recommendations from government organizations or people that are they are being influenced by, as opposed um, to some of the statistics or some of the facts that are being outlined as they said. Uh, for example, uh, one of the recommendations in the initially was, we, you don't need to wear a mask. I knew that was wrong from the very get-go. Because when the recommendation was, was initially stagnated, it was because of the need for medical professionals to get masks. And I get that. The problem is there was no transparency. The problem is they said, you don't need masks. And you actually had subject matter experts in the medical health profession come out and say masks don't do anything. Which I know as a, you know, I'm an EMT, I'm an EMT 15 years ago, but I'm a, a, a combat lifesaver kind of guy but I also work with a lot of medical professionals and I've been around this thing uh, my entire life. And I know mask, one, they don't, most masks that are commercially bought, uh, which included, uh, include the N95 mask, don't filter uh, uh, viruses or they don't stop the fil filtration of viruses, but they do reduce the amount of, of, um, of, uh, uh, respiratory infection coming out of your lungs, right? Because if, if, if it's not able to transfer in, in the fluid that's, that's uh, shot out of my mouth three feet from my nose, then that is not in the air. So again, we, we decided that it wasn't a thing and there's people who stood behind it saying masks don't work. Well, masks work when you wear it and I wear it. If we both agree and we both wear it, it works. So now you have this convolution where people are doing, some people are doing the right thing and some people just don't care. So at this point, my recommendation is you can't, you, you can't just go out into the world and just bank that everybody's going to do the right thing. Assume the worst, which is no, nobody's doing the right thing and maybe not even to their own fault. So that means I'm going to socially separate myself more so than I would in, in social, and not only in social distancing, but not in exposure. I mean, there's some people in this, in this world um, because of their job who are exposed by, by network to thousands of people a day. 
because if people in my network and Silicon Valley meet, uh, you know, 25 people from another company, they come back and that translates to hundreds, if not thousands of people that you're potentially exposed to reduce your overall exposure. Um, and, and focus on your immunity. Most people forget that the, the best way to fight this uh, disease, uh, which happens to be an infectious virus, is building their own immunity, which means vitamins, which means exercise, which is, is the best way to disrupt and then advance your resilience uh, in immunity, and then sleep. So you could actually now, in the lull of people trying to navigate this and what it's going to do, build your immunity to set yourself up for success if you are exposed. And, and you know, it, it's a very difficult circumstance. I, I made a projection a long time ago that this was going to be about 20% of our nation by the end of this fiscal year, which would be February or January of next year, will be infected. And I think it's going to be more than that now. I also think that uh, in, in everything that's going on with mass protest and mass congregation and mass people saying, I'm just done with it, that when it comes back in strength, it's probably going to be mutated in some form or fashion. And then this fall, just like the, the, uh, in 1918, it did with the Spanish flu or influenza, it is going to have a second and third wave. That second wave historically uh, came in 1918, in October. And in the month of October, it killed 200,000 people. Of the 650,000 to 675,000 people, it killed in the United States. So uh, I, I don't see any way that we potentially could avoid that unless we're doing it as individuals. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I, I know nobody asked me, but uh, I would add to the recommendation list sunlight. I've uh, seen a whole bunch of the vitamin D yes. Yes. Uh, studies and that seems to be a big one. And pretty much everyone is vitamin D deficient. Yes, absolutely. It is. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, we will wrap up there. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. If people are interested in following up with you, seeing what you're up to field craft stuff, like where are the places that you want to direct people to go uh, on the podcast side of things, I'll put all the links in the, the show notes as well. Yeah, you know, I always tell people that if you want to be involved in being better prepared, it has to be convenient. I, I hate to say that because uh, I would think that people want to think outside the box, but I, I find myself looking for that same convenience. Uh, when, when I'm looking at a pistol inside my waistband, if it's uncomfortable, I won't carry that pistol. So I'll never have that preparation. So what we've done is we've given a lot of free opportunities and content for people to dab their toes in the water, to see if there's something they're interested in. I start off with the, the survival, Philcraft Survival Podcast because I podcast everybody in survival preparedness in that genre so you could advance your individual or navigate your individual uh, preparedness based on your interest. You like ham radios? I got Joss Noss. You like, uh, you know, military stuff? I had uh, a guy that was on the Osama Bin Laden raid. So you could learn like I learned in books and through conversations on that podcast. Second is the YouTube channel. The Phil Craft Survival Channel is a very good way to connect people to video content in the short form version of the education. 10 minute blurbs of light tactics, lights that you put on your mobility platform, uh, best everyday carry considerations, the list goes on. Uh, and then Philcraft Everything, Philcraft Survival on Instagram. Uh, my personal Instagram is mike.a.glover. Uh, I'm a little political and I'm not afraid to, to say that um, because uh, I'm, I'm, you can call me probably center right. Uh, I like being there because I'm not fringe, but I like educating people on the worst case, but also on political things that are going on in our world. Um, so follow me for that. And then we have every kind of handle. I mean, we got Twitter, we have uh, Facebook, what, whatever you're liking, just Google Phil Craft Survival and you could find us. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate talking with you. Looking forward to your Instagram post about your library and of course, all the other content that you uh, put out in the future. No, thank you. Thank you for doing this podcast and being uh, a, a little bit more academic and intellectual about it because that's so important to deep dive that kind of thing. And it's a, a breath of fresh air to be able to do something like that. Thank you for having me on.